Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next chapter in our Minox Event webinar series. My name is Brian Phipps. I'm one of the engineers here at Minox Event. I'm joined today by Fiberglass Division Manager Jim Wishusen. Jim's been with Minox Event since 2010, and as the division manager, provides frontline front line support for both the representatives and end users and also installers of our fiberglass products. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. In the lower left corner of your screen, you'll note that there's a chat box that you can type in any questions or comments that may come to mind as we go through the presentation, and we'll do our best to answer them uh, as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Good morning, Brian, and thank you very much, and good morning to all of you. Appreciate your time spent with us here today. We are talking about the underduct product today and the testing that has been done on it uh, and how that relates to growing trends in the HVAC design and, and growing trends in code organizations. So in the last 10 years, uh, more and more engineers, more and more architects are putting and looking to put supply duct, uh, return duct, exhaust in the ground um, and it's becoming a, uh, a worldwide trend that we're seeing here at Minoxidant. So the, uh, the very first thing that you want to think about uh, as you present this to engineers and as engineers think about doing this themselves is why is this push? Why are we here? Where is this going? And what's the, uh, the advent of going underground in the first place? Well, the obvious question, answer to this question and what you have seen before in previous webinar is the whole displacement ventilation, okay? Uh, in up till, say, uh, 12 years ago, the common way of doing ventilation was with mixed air ventilation, where in cooling mode, um, your, your air comes out at a very high velocity, uh, at a very cold temperature, and both your supply and your return duct are at a high elevation. Well, displacement is completely different, where your supply duct is at a low elevation, uh, your return duct is still up high, <clears throat> and in cooling mode, the uh, air is coming out at a much higher temperature, at much lower velocity. Uh, the end result in a building, as you see in these uh, comparison um, fluid dynamics shots you see here, the building on the left is representative of a mixed air ventilation where the entire building is a homogeneous temperature and also a homogeneous mix of uh, contaminants, whereas the building uh, on the right, same building using displacement, has got that stratification of not only temperatures, but contaminants uh, being pushed up towards the ceiling. Uh, when you take a look at the EPA, um, their take on it is that, okay, yeah, we encourage this, uh, this design change going from mixed air ventilation to displacement, uh, not only for the energy savings, which are significant in cooling mode, but also because it is a passive way of cutting down on the transference of pathogens amongst humans. Anytime you have uh, a large building where a whole bunch of humans congregate, uh, any way you can cut down on diseases in that building is a bonus. So if you take a look at what ASHRAE did, they looked at hospitals using this technique. And again, this is uh, and in other webinars, you can look back and, and read up on this if you like, but the basic concept is that uh, displacement ventilation uh, has been become more and more popular, uh, and it is uh, likely to grow more and more, especially in large buildings. Uh, some of the projects that Minoxidil has done through our rep system, uh, the Dublin Performing Arts Center in California, this is a very large auditorium where every bit of supply duct was in the ground, return duct up high, classic displacement ventilation. Uh, the energy savings in a building like this or a room like this is, uh, is tr absolutely tremendous, not to mention the fact that it's a quieter system. Uh, another example would be the Davenport Public Library. Now this one, and again, this all goes back to why people are going underground. This particular project is the poster child for uh, displacement ventilation because this 
library system, they built two branches approximately uh, uh, three, four years apart. Same architect, so from space, these two buildings are identical. You have the same square footage, same layout, same elevations, obviously same geography. Two different uh, engineers, however. The first engineering firm designed uh, around mixed air ventilation. The second firm designed around displacement ventilation. Now they're looking at utility costs forensically in, in cooling mode. The building that's using displacement ventilation is using 60% less energy uh, during the summer, six zero. You can't ignore that. So obviously there's a benefit to going in displacement and that's where this push is coming from. Our last example is uh, the uh, White Bay Cruise passenger ship terminal in Sydney where every bit of supply duct was buried in the uh, uh, sandstone pier going out to where the boats, the ships come in. And again, this is another uh, fine example of displacement ventilation along with many others that we have done here at Minoxivent. Uh, so you get the idea that um, of course, under duct can be used along with displacement ventilation, which then enables the architect to build even more open spaces and grandiose rooms. Okay, so you get the idea of why we are here. So now let's take a look at what has been required of non metallic duct. Well, it's all about testing, okay? And that's kind of what we're looking at today as a whole. Uh, there's uh, many different organizations that you can have your product tested for. <clears throat> and the one that uh, Minoxavent has been tested with is through the ICC, International Code Council. Okay, so all 50 states and the District of Columbia adopt IMC, that being International Mechanical Code, as part of their state building code with some minor tweaks. Okay, so if you want to take your product and have it evaluated to make sure that it fully complies with your state building code or IMC, you go to what's called ICC, ES evaluation service and the evaluation service has a listing criteria um, that describes the testing that's required for whatever your product may be and for non-metallic duct that listing criteria is labeled LC 1014 and the four main tests that you see here uh, is what is required your surface burning test your strength test your leakage test and your uh, insulation test. Okay, so first and foremost, and this is uh, geared exactly towards where other organizations are headed, is your ASTM E84 test. All right, this is an extremely important test, um, not only for health and safety, uh, but also for uh, the design of the system, you're putting a duct into the ground, okay? So you wanna make sure that this non-metallic duct um, has the capability to withstand fire uh, and not collapse and, and uh, uh, you end up losing your, your supply duct, your exhaust duct, your return. So it's a very important test, okay? So let's take a look at where folks are headed in the world of code and uh, code bodies. Uh, right now, SMACNA, um, if you uh, haven't had a good weekend read, it's called the Thermoset FRP Construction Manual, which was originally written in the mid-1990s, okay? I think it was 1995. And the original construction manual was geared mostly towards corrosion applications, wastewater treatment plants, odor duct, water treatment plants, uh, uh, chemical room exhaust, um, and it really had nothing to do with underground duct. Well, right now, uh, Terry Cahill in our office, Minoxavent office, uh, he's on the current task force that is rewriting the SMACNA Thermoset FRP construction manual. That's actually absolutely huge if you think about it. Uh, I believe this manual is, is slated to come out in 2016. And uh, Terry informs us that uh, SMACNA uh, is now looking at a whole chapter of underground duct, FRP duct for underground use, whereas they, they kind of ignored it before. 
So uh, in this rewritten thermos, thermoset FRP construction manual, one of the first things that they require, will be requiring, is a low smoke, low flame duct. So Smackner understands the importance of that safety test. Uh, underwriters laboratories. Right now, you cannot get a UL listed non-metallic duct for below ground applications. Their jurisdiction stops at the floor. That's easily checkable. You can call up UL and they will tell you that. However, we have been talking with UL ourselves because we find that they are now interested in going on the ground. They're looking to develop a standard for non-metallic duct. <clears throat> and the general consensus is that uh, UL will be requiring a low smoke, low flame for non-metallic duct. And it makes sense because UL is all about health and safety. So what is this ASTM E84 test? Uh, basically, it's a uh, test where you have your material in a chamber that has a specified airflow, and you subject that material to a particular temperature flame. I think it's methane is the fuel of a certain size, and it has to be in contact with the sample for a minute. And <clears throat> after that, they compare not only the flame spread, but also the smoke spread as compared to red oak, okay? And to pass this test, you have to have less than a flame spread of 25, less than a smoke spread of 50. Now, we have done our own in-house testing along with our third-party testing required by ICC, uh, and I'm about to show you a quick video on that that shows it exactly what this test is uh, involved with, and it shows you the results. So I encourage you to sit back, watch a brief video, and Brian, if you can, go ahead and start. Hello, my name is Brian Phipps, and I am one of the engineers here at Minox Event. Today, I invite you to review a video with me regarding flame and smoke ratings of ductwork. As we get started here, you will notice two separate videos with our underduct product on the left and a competitor's non-metallic duct on the right. Minox Event tested these samples in the same chamber, using the same equipment, operated by the same individual. We are not an accredited testing laboratory, so these results are not official. This video merely demonstrates the importance of choosing a Class 1 duct material and provides a brief illustration of a Class 1 duct's capabilities. That being said, a third-party lab has tested our product, and underduct is ICC listed for direct burial as a Class 1 duct material. According to the IMC, that is the International Mechanical Code, buried ductwork does not have to be Class 1, so our competitor is up to code in that respect. Whereas our competitor uses this line of code to say, why should my duct be Class 1 if it doesn't have to be? Our mentality at Minox Event is, why shouldn't my duct be Class 1 if it can be? Once we remove the flame source, the competitor's product continues to support a flame, while underduct never ignited to begin with. Note, as the duct on the right continues to burn, it melts and drips still burning product to the bottom of the test chamber. A disaster, such as the Centralia Mine Fire in Pennsylvania, demonstrates underground fires are not only possible, but a very real concern. The three primary ingredients to fires are heat, fuel, and oxygen. If a fire has access to all three ingredients, and suppressants such as halon do not interrupt its chemical reaction, combustion will continue. In conclusion, I hope this simple test illustrates the importance of choosing a Class 1 duct material. Thank you for your time, and have a great day. Thank you, Brian. Um, clearly, what you saw there was uh, an indicator of how well Underduck does um, stand up to fire situations. And as we go down the road where SMACNA is requiring this and uh, UL is requiring this, uh, and even if you take a look at, obviously, uh, listing criteria 1014, they're requiring it for um, products that are other than what is currently specified the bottom line is that we are way ahead of the curve on that and uh, more importantly uh, the frp duct itself the underduct product itself 
has passed that test. And before I go on to the pipe stiffness test, it's important to understand because there are other FRP products out there that either have not passed this test, or even done this test, or they have passed this test through the use of metallic liners. Okay, so let me explain. Envision that test that you just saw where um, we could take that underduct material, we could cut it in half, we could cut it diagonally, we can cut it longitudinally, it doesn't matter. That, that duct resin, that duct formulation is what has passed that test. So it is, uh, uh, it will pass the ASTM E84 no matter how you slice it, excuse the pun. Uh, if you take a look at uh, other, other FRP manufacturers, they will pass that same test, not through the formulation of their, their resin, but simply by putting in a metallic liner that blocks the spread on the interior only. So clearly, underduct is way ahead of the curve in the ASTM E84 testing requirements uh, just through its formulation. Okay, so moving on, uh, uh, the second thing that ICC ES demands through their listing criteria 1014 is the pipe stiffness test, okay? And for those of you who are not aware of what this test is, um, it's a parallel plate loading test. And what they do is they put a, a sample, and I believe the sample length is approximately 15 inches. And whatever the di diameter of the uh, duct is, they, they basically apply, apply pressure with the top plate until that duct deflects 5% of its diameter. And then they look at the pressure that it has built up in order to do that deflection. Building code states that uh, underground non-metallic duct shall have a minimum pipe stiffness of eight PSI at 5% deflection. So for example, a 20 inch diameter duct, 5% deflection would be one inch. They're gonna uh, squish this duct one inch and the pressure that develops behind that moving plate has to be a minimum of eight PSI. Uh, if you take a look at two of our samples that were tested by an independent lab, 6-inch and 20-inch, and your pipe stiffness, 274, 230 on the single wall, on the single wall and double wall, 6-inch, and then on the 20-inch, 12.3 uh, and 36.2, clearly we are way above what current building code requires. Uh, and understand that these values were... Uh, achieved with duct that was based on the minimum standards of uh, NBS, National Bureau of Standards, product standard 1569. So these are the bare minimum of our FRP construction parameters. Uh, as you've seen in other webinars, the FRP duct can be made much stronger, as strong as you like, including up to H20 loading capability without the, the uh, duct being encased in concrete. So the bottom line is that our bare minimum standards, our duct has passed significantly through this test. Okay, so now the next test that ICC required from us was the leakage test. And, and this is important for underground duct for obvious reasons. In high water areas, you wanna make sure that your duct does not leak. So what do they do? Well, uh, whatever your depth that you're looking to be approved at uh, is, you need to submerge your sealed sample, and the sample has to be a minimum of four fittings connected to five straight duct sections, okay? Uh, you need to be submerged at twice that depth, okay? So what you're looking at is a, uh, a sample that was sent to a third-party lab, <clears throat> and it was uh, held underwater, and a vacuum port was attached to the duct, and what this did was it applied negative pressure on the inside of the duct, which simulated the pressure that this duct would experience at 12 foot underwater. And it was left that way for 24 hours. And after that time, as you can see, the report states that there was no water infiltration. So per LC1014, because we, were, uh, we passed at 12 foot underwater, we are now approved to be buried six feet underwater. Uh, very important in parts of the world that have high waters. Matter of fact, that Sydney, Australia project that you saw before, uh, that is in a pier way, and every 12 hours that duct is underwater when high tide comes in. So obviously we are uh, good to go on that and ahead of the curve as well. 
Well, Jim, let me interrupt you here quick to answer a quick question that's come in here. Uh, we've mentioned earlier that all of this testing is according to LC 1014 uh, listing criteria for the ICC. Now, do all of our competitors and all underground ductworks have to pass all aspects of this listing criteria in order to get an ICC listing? Uh, that's a that's a good question, Brian. And the um, the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is uh, because of the way existing code. Remember, listing criteria 1014. Uh, the test in it makes sure that your duct complies fully with the way code is written. So if you take a look at what uh, the uh, how existing mechanical code is worded. It states that uh, underground non-metallic duct shall be PVC, HDPE, or approved. Okay, that's basically a, a slimmed down version of what it actually says. But the bottom line, you, you can use PVC, HDPE, or you can use an, an approved. Well, obviously, we are not uh, PVC or HDPE, so we had to get approved. Right now, again, um, if you want to use PVC and HDPE, those materials are not subject to all of the testing. And the biggest one is the low smoke, low flame. Um, so the answer to your question is no, not everybody has to uh, do all of the testing that we have. So then that brings you back to the statements before regarding SMACNA and UL, uh, where uh, looking down the road, this low smoke, low flame requirement is going to be coming more and more popular. So even though right now existing building code states that you don't have to have this low smoke, low flame test, um, we at Minoxavent have always felt that is, has been a number one priority, and obviously we have passed that test, so we meet future codes and existing codes as well. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yes, thank you, Jim. So, thanks, Brian. So the last test that listing criteria 1014 uh, requires is an insulation test. And the test that uh, uh, was sub our, our underduct product was subjected to was the ASTM C518. Uh, now, again, this has been a subject of previous webinars. I encourage you to go back and take a look at this. But uh, what it entails, it's, uh, it's a heat flow meter. And you're looking at a picture of... Um, uh, example of what it is. You have something about the size of a microwave and it has two flat plates and you take your sample of whatever it may be, whether it be a, a piece of wallboard or, or a duct and, and you use approximately a one inch thickness uh, sample that's 12 inches by 12 inches and that fits into this little microwave oven. The top plate comes down and the door is closed and on the two plates there are sensors in the middle, roughly about four inches by four inches on both the bottom and the top plate. Now the bottom plate is kept hot, the top plate is kept cold. There's roughly a delta T of somewhere around 40 degrees and they allow this to run like this for about an hour. So they monitor the power going into both plates and they, they keep track of how much power is used to keep the hot plate hot and how much power is used to keep the cold plate cold. So what you're actually measuring is how much energy was being transmitted through that sample uh, as the heat from the lower plate wanted to get to the cold plate on top. Heat always goes towards cold. <clears throat> so that being said, the uh, underduct product was tested for this uh, widely accepted um, test, which is what the Federal Trade Commission requires for insulation testing. And you can see the results here, uh, whereas our single wall product um, has a value of R1, uh, the double wall product at one inch insulation was a documented R6 insulation value, which uh, meets most, if not all, building re uh, code requirements throughout the United States. Uh, on just by increasing the um, uh, thickness of that insulation, we can actually get up to an R14 insulation value. But understand that the product was tested properly with the ASTM C518 test, and uh, it has <clears throat> passed the requirements of all building code. 
So that pretty much ends our discussion on what testing the Underduck product has been put through, uh, how it uh, is looking forward to uh, requirements where especially the ASTM E84 low smoke, low flame requirements are headed. Uh, so understand that you have access to the leading edge product in this field according to standards. Um, this is important to engineers. This is important to end users. Uh, what's important to installers is not so much what we've talked about today, but more so what it takes to install, uh, what the labor is, how to estimate it, that sort of thing. So I encourage you to come back to our October webinar where we will be discussing exactly that uh, interview with uh, an installer who is now an estimator who's personally installed this product and now regularly estimates uh, projects with this, um, with this in, in line. So you'll get to learn all about how uh, how much and what the details are on installing this product. I thank you for your time. I appreciate any comments that you might have, and uh, uh, you folks have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Before you go off on me here, I do have uh, one more question that's come in here, a little bit last minute. Um, you mentioned that the FTC Federal Trade Commission requires the ASTM C518 test for uh, with regard to insulation values. But does the ICC require the ASTM C518 insulation test, or do they allow other methods for measuring insulation? Oh, that's a great question, Brian, and it's actually a can of worms because there's a point of contention with uh, LC, Listing Criteria 1014 through ICC, in that they do accept an alternative way uh, to determine insulation value, um, although it's been discredited in the sense that this alternative method uh, it was put forth by an organization called NSF, okay, and it talks about uh, the proper name is NSF P374, uh, and this, this protocol talks about thermal distribution efficiency, and whereas the ASTM C518 test physically measures how much energy you can get through a given product, the NSF protocol basically is a comparison test that, well, if we uh, shoot hot air through a duct that's wrapped in insulation and then we shoot hot air through a, uh, your test duct and, well, the temperatures on the, uh, the temperature difference between the beginning and the end are relatively close, well, then the, uh, this protocol states that this duct has the thermal distribution efficiency equal to that of a duct wrapped in R10. Um, that point of contention is um, backed up by the fact that if you talk to NSF, they come right out and state that uh, this protocol should not be used to determine our value, uh, and it is not equivalent to the ASTM C518, yet right now ICCES is allowing for that, which um, yeah, really doesn't make sense, but common sense tells you that if you have uh, a laboratory, a third-party ICC accredited laboratory um, that tests not only our sample, okay, um, and comes up with an R6 and then tests a uh, competitor's piece of duct that uses this NSF to justify insulation claims and it comes out at R less than 1, I think it's a 0 0.92, and clearly something is wrong with that NSF protocol and should be, not be used. So that's just a common sense uh, item that engineers need to look at objectively. All right, thank you, Jim. And with the end of that question, that concludes today's webinar on fiberglass products. Uh, we appreciate the patience and time you've given us today in, in this ever busy and modern day. We know time is a very valuable asset, never seems to be enough of it. And we do appreciate the time you take to spend with us on these monthly webinars. This webinar, along with all of our previous webinars, can be found on our YouTube channel. So if you or someone else in the office uh, or some, an engineer, architect, customer, you'd like to see one of our old webinars, you can go to our website at www.fiberglass-duct.com, click on the Dig Deeper tab, and click Webinars. If you have any questions that we weren't able to get to today or 
uh, something sparks your interest later on, feel free to give myself, Jim Wishusen, uh, Sam Stelzner, really anyone in our office here at Minoxidil a call. We're more than happy to help out with not just the quoting process, but installation instructions, uh, design questions, uh, and so on. Next month's webinar will be on source capture products. It'll be on the last Friday of the month, which I believe is September 25th at 10 a.m. Central. And I thank you again. Hope to see you all there, and have a great weekend.